Hey guys, Johnny Disc Golf back with another interview. This time joined by the TD, one of the TDs of the newly minted OTB Open, Mr. Sean Jack. How you doing? I'm awesome. Thank you so much for having me here. Yeah, happy to have you on. And news, in case you have not heard, um, the stay-at-home order has been lifted in San Francisco. So, Sean, feel free in your own home uh, to go ahead and unmask, unnegator. Oh, awesome. Okay. Um, you should be free. I know those are on sale at dgpd.com, so good, yep. Yep. Uh, good, good plug there. But um, first question and, and first topic I want to touch on, uh, you know, OTB Open, mm -hmm. biggest news probably in in uh, you know your world the past couple of days at least. Um, what's been the reaction on your end? I haven't heard anything negative. Uh, you know, we launched yesterday late afternoon Pacific time. Um, we had uh, a bunch of likes and shares. I think it was shared 40 to 50 times. And this was a new page that we, mm -hmm. we built from nothing. And Corey, uh, uh, our, our artist, our, our graphic designer for the, for the team is Jeff Bays. Um, and he did a great job of the new logo and he was able to give you Corey, uh, some vector art with all <laughs> the pieces separated and you made a really cool uh animated um uh, video or gif sorry if i don't know the exact terminology mm -hmm. and yeah, just animation yeah that actually uh, as of this morning was seen nearly five thousand times boom uh, which is pretty remarkable organic reach considering uh this was a page that was invented yesterday so yeah everyone's really psyched um one of the reasons why we actually went to otv is because they have brand equity in the sport now um and uh, we couldn't be more excited about it. Yeah, I'm. I'm glad you kind of segued us into that a little bit. Uh, you mentioned, you know, one of the reasons why you went with OTB. I guess let's talk a little bit about what made that decision the decision. Um, you know, in years past, it was San Francisco Open. It was at Glen Eagles, the city that we live in. Um, so, what brought you to, you know, moving it an hour and a half away? We can't even sleep in our own beds anymore. <laughs> um. I would say the order of operations goes back to the fall where Sean Mercy, um, co-TD and also a partner of mine for Thousand Raider Productions, which is the company that runs the event, uh, need, we decided we needed to, in the SWOT analysis, strength, weakness, opportunity, threats, the the threat was uh, that the city of San Francisco, while wildly, pop, wildly uh, liberal culturally, has been the most conservative major metro area in this in the country as far as COVID restrictions. Mm -hmm. So we absolutely did not want to be working uh, tons of hours, spending money, sourcing partnerships, and then have the rug pulled out from underneath us and the event being canceled. Mm -hmm. uh, even though things to be looking in, in the right direction right now, there's just too much uncertainty. So we started looking at uh, courses in the greater Bay Area, and we looked at three to four to five different locations. And uh, Crash, who is the Delta Windjammers president, brought me to the Swenson Golf Course about two months ago. We sat down with the general manager and a representative from Visit Stockton, which is like their tourism arm. Mm -hmm. And we started chatting with them, and the numbers just really made sense for us. And I remember going from Swenson to OTB's Pro Shop and thinking, you know, what's the name of the tournament going to be? And is it going to be the NeuroCal Open, the Greater Bay Area Open, the Stockton Open. And I was like, you know what? It doesn't make sense to assign a location because this might happen again. Mm -hmm. Like maybe we have to change the, we want to move because of COVID or because this new badass course just opened up 45 minutes north of San Francisco um, on a golf course or at this new property. And so naming it OTB Open allows us to be nimble and pivot mm -hmm. and move location without having the tournament be uh, centric to a name. So OTB, is it more than just the name though? Like, did they just, you know, we want to sponsor the tournament by having it, uh, our name on top, you know, it, it is in their, their hometown, but how are they going to be involved, I guess, outside of, you know, just straight cash for ads? Uh, great question. Uh, so when, when I remember walking in, I said to uh, Danny Corbett, who is the uh, owner of OTB, you know, what about actually inserting your name into the title as opposed to being OTB presents Mm -hmm. the Stockton Open brought to you by Innova, which is uh, one that's just a little long, right? Yeah. And uh, like our tournament last year was uh, the San Francisco Open brought uh, presented by Innova Disc at Glen Eagles Golf Course. So it's just a little <laughs> bit too much. Yeah. And they uh, 
they were the team there was just totally on board. Um, I think it's they spend smartly a lot of money supporting a lot of things in disc golf, GK Pro Skins, podcasts, mm -hmm. the Pro Tour itself. My channel and at think, times. Yeah, your channel at times. Like, And I think this was just a natural extension. It was to insert their name into the title. So beyond, obviously, uh, uh, cash contribution to help support the tour because Disc Golf Pro Tour events are expensive to run, mm -hmm. uh, not just the $15,000 added cash, but there's a lot of other moving pieces. Um, so we built actually a partnership where uh, it's actually working together with OTB and Innova mm. to access the CFR, TFR, and hopefully Halo program, which uh, provides them OTB uh, access to disc that they might not otherwise be able to get. So it's it's <laughs> me brokering the relationship between them and them, and then we actually all share together in the growth. So Innova has a contribution for cash and product. OTB has a minimum, but our goal is to blow the doors off and Innova getting 5X, 10X what they invested into us. OTB uh, selling discs through their site, selling you know you know hoodies through their site, selling neck gaiters through their site. And because they have customers all over the country and all over the world that we're hoping to make this event cool, fresh, that, uh, you know, you can get a flat top glow firebird, um, mm -hmm. or God, can you imagine like a halo pole cap? Oh, with, I was going to ask if you would say it. <laughs> I said it. I'm trying. <laughs> Believe me. I'm trying. Uh, um, well, we're not sure, we're not sure that the halo, uh, molds or the, we're not sure the pole cap mold can be accommodated for halo. Mm. But it is something I have said way too many times in my calls with Innova. It's something that I feel like a large percentage of the internet has said far too many times in <laughs> Innova's social posts. So I know it's on their radar. Fingers yeah. crossed, please. No, they could come out with like the Halo Ace, right? The, the <laughs> yeah. disc that guarantees the Ace every time, and people would say, we don't care. We want both. Uh, exactly. Um, well, let's talk about the course uh, because that's, you know, for 90% of the people who engage with this tournament, it's going to be from afar, um, you know, maybe things on site, they're not re really going to, you know, be, be interacting with them. Um, the course is going to be the largest change for most people. It was at Glen Eagles before, fantastic property, lots of elevation, wind. Um, sell me yeah. on the course. Where are we playing? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I would say when we made the change, there was two distinct negatives in the con column. One was not being in San Francisco. Uh, we mm -hmm. love our city. The, the opportunities for food, live music, culture, uh, I'm sorry, outweigh what is available in Stockton. Although Stockton is a city on the rise and has lots mm -hmm. to offer. And then, in my opinion, Glen Eagles is arguably the best dual course in the sport that we have. I'm sure there are other ones, but it's, it's badass. You know, mm -hmm. it's got elevation, wind, s sweeping views of the city uh, and the bay. And there's just not, we just can't overcome that. Um, so we knew going in that, that was going to be certainly something that we can't live up to, but, uh, the designer of Glen Eagles and Golden Gate Park and other courses around, his name is Leonard Muse, and he has his own little mobile store called Whirlwind, and we have hired him to build, uh, uh, MPO, FPO, Disc Golf Pro Tour centric course at Swenson. So wow. Swenson, Swenson right now is an 18 hole golf course with a nine hole executive course. Mm. The 18, the, the disc golf course is currently on the nine hole executive. We have gone ahead and rented out holes 10 through 18 of the big golf course. Ah. So we've added, I think 30 to 50 extra acres, uh, nice. to the mad scientists of Leonard Muse <laughs> to essentially look at as nearly a blank canvas mm -hmm. and He's, he's mapping out an 18 hole track that uh, unfortunately Sacramento's in the Delta and that means it's flat. So yeah. there's not really much we can do with elevation, but there's lots of water. I think nine of the holes will feature water. Um, <sighs> and I know there's at least three to four gut check hole eight, hole 14 Maple Hill type holes sure. that a water exactly, um, will be something that you have to do. So we're actually looking for like uh, a disc retriever sponsor. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> uh, that has to be something. Yeah, the, the quick stick or the golden retriever, uh -huh. um, that'll, be, that'll be a good fit. Or maybe someone that's uh, got their scuba license because I, I would imagine that some discs will be lost. But uh, Leonard's been out there many, many hours. If anyone that knows him, he's kind of crazy <laughs> and dedicates a lot of time. Crazy in a good way. Yeah, I was going to say. A, he's a savant. 
Uh -huh. So uh, I'm actually going out to look at the course on Saturday with a few other folks uh, to see where it stands. And then we're hoping to have some test events in the lead up to the event. Wow. No, I mean, uh, can't wait for it to all, all to get kicked off. Two questions on the OTB Open kind of before we move on. One, you said, uh, you know, some test events, some events before the big show. Um, could you talk a little bit about the AM side and kind of like it, how does that function relative to the pro tournament? Sure. So we, uh, for the first time, we have a three-day A-tier amateur event the weekend before. Uh, it's Mother's Day weekend. Um, and while we have hired Leonard to make an MPO, FPO style track, he is also keeping in mind um, how the amateurs can approach this. I will immediately say that I, I'll give the AM1 guys the opportunity to play the pro, the pro track, the MPO mm -hmm. one. And I think uh, naturally, I think divisions like M uh, AM2, AM40, AM50 can certainly play the FPO track. And uh, because this is running during the women's global events, we're hoping to have uh, a large group of women players. Mm -hmm. So we will likely have to just create temporary tee pads on some of the holes to accommodate, especially when there's a water carry. Um, yeah. You know, I'd love to see some girls under 18 um, attending the event, and we will obviously have to make some changes regarding either basket or tee positions. Mm -hmm. Um, so, is, so the idea being, um, is, it, I guess, is there any sort of like tie in like Masters Cup kind of do, does where they tie in the AM side to the open side? Is there any plans on doing anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so one thing that we've struggled for, honestly, on our budget is never having like a, a full scale amateur events. We've mm -hmm. done like, you know, one day C tiers yeah. in the last few years. And there was just challenges because Glen Eagles is a golf course that's expensive to take over. Mm -hmm. And Golden Gate Park has obviously one of the most beloved courses, you know, anywhere, but we can only rent that for three times a year. And that's for the SFDDC. Uh, by the way, check out Corey's documentary, Shameless Plug yes. on the Golf Network at Golden State of Mind. Mm -hmm. um, but now, because we're moving outside the city and we have this golf course, we can rent it for the amateurs. So it one, it's a fundraising tool uh, to raise the money. In the past years, the SFO has cost us like, around fifty thousand mm -hmm. um, dollars combination of security and bathrooms and swag and it adds up quickly so the amateur event will be a supporting event and then uh we'll go ahead and say we'll give the best uh the best uh women and the best male score free entry into the pro tournament Boom. which is which is a master's cup tradition yep and i think they did it actually at mvp open um yeah steve does it also yeah and i think it's just a cool i think it's a cool nod you know and, and it's like a cool prize to get a lot of ams especially from around the region real competitive ones a chance to you know maybe get featured on coverage if that's an option or or something like yeah, that Yeah, i don't know about that i know the tour um is narrowing its focus on who gets to be on feature cards in the first round but i know in the mvp it's been like the winner uh and i know i know a couple of times that's actually i've seen the guy like shoot significantly worse Oh yeah! When, oh my gosh! I, when I, they're on the big stage, um, playing with the best guys in the world. Yes, but Ian. I, Ian filmed the Am winner and the poor kid, man. It was just yeah. like forty feet shorter on all his drives. You know he's yeah. a better player than that. Yeah, it's just uh, when you're on camera, things, and when you're playing next to Paul and Ricky, there's, <laughs> there's just more pressure. Yeah, and plus, also just having a large scale amateur event with like we're looking for 150 plus players mm -hmm. is a great way just to have a grassroots movement and marketing for it. Like Absolutely. all the players. COVID aside, like we're looking to scale our event with thousands of spectators and grandstands and having an amateur focused event beforehand allows us just to drum up support for it and lead up to it. Yeah, no question. I'm looking forward to really how that unfolds um, and everything. I want to move on from that tournament a little bit, the OTB Open. Going to be great. L super looking forward to it. But um, you are involved with disc golf even more than just being the tournament director of one of the biggest tournaments, uh, you know, in the country, if not the world, you are now full-time employee with the pro tour. Could you talk mm -hmm. about your title and maybe like what it's like making that shift into a more full-time? Yeah. Role? Yeah. Uh, so I, I've actually worked with Steve since 2015 on a consultative basis or contractor basis, working for the tour, mm -hmm. doing sponsorships. And then it was sometime during the beginning uh, or the spring of 2020, uh, as the tour was, as disc golf was exploding, and so was interest in the tour, that Jeff Spring and I had conversations about bringing me on board of the fall of 2020 full time uh, to be the director of partnerships, um, or simply I'm the sales guy for the tour, sure. right? That's that's what it comes down to. Um, 
and because I started on November 1st, the formal announcement was made, I think, at the beginning of the year. And then I had, you know, the UDISC interview. So it's becoming more, more known. But yeah, my, I don't have another day-to-day -day job. My focus is specifically on everything I do is now disc golf focused, whether it's uh, signing up sponsors for the Pro Tour, uh, the OTBO, um, and then a couple other endeavors I have, uh, Stokes in the Fire. Sure. Um, how has your how has your role changed? Like not not specifically, I guess your role, but like how has doing your job changed? Has it gotten a little easier? Has it gotten more difficult from when you just started till now? No, it's crazy to think that I wasn't doing it full time before. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the, the pro tour uh, gained so much popularity and engagement in 2020 that it increased demand uh, for sponsors, and we also have double or triple the staff of what we did last year mm -hmm. and we're offering more unique opportunities for sponsors too so it's i'm working with the media team the retail team marketing team uh, to all coalesce together to figure out the best way that we can represent the tour and the partners themselves and i'll tell you like i'm in, right now we are i think four day four weeks today from uh the first disc being thrown at the las vegas challenge and i have so much work to do uh, <laughs> as far as sourcing the ads, getting physical yeah. on flight, on course assets made. And I'm on the phone four to six hours a day. And I think, uh, which leaves not much time for administrative work. Right. Yeah. And, uh, so I, I'm, I have stuff to do for sure. And while wow, we're also, you know, we just launched our own tournament and this yeah. stuff, you know, there, there's just a lot of moving parts. Um, but I'm just grinding through it. Yeah, I can't. I've never been busier in my professional life. I don't think, to be honest. Wow. Which and is it a, happens to be disc golf, which like what ten years ago, you know. Try explaining that to yourself. Uh, my I started playing in 08. I played the 08 Vibram Open, and I remember like hearing Nate and Avery whispering, you know, next year's the year that disc golf's going to explode, and <laughs> you know, it just took a pandemic to let everyone know how much fun our sport is, and. Yeah you can be outside with the people you love even during the harshest restrictions so mm -hmm. it's uh disc golf has certainly been uh certainly benefited uh from a strange world that we're in right now um and so has the tour and in general outdoor based companies have seen tremendous growth since the pandemic and those are our sponsors like so it's yeah it's kind of a perfect storm that's happened in the last uh 12 months it's it's something that I've been really interested in, really. Like, as the sport grows, it, the need for high-level tournament directors is greater than ever, in my eyes, okay? And one of the issues that I think that we struggle from as a scene, especially at the top professional level, is that it's still solely volunteerism-based, or at least it's, it's like, supposed to be. And if it's not, there's kind of some repercussions from the community. Mm -hmm. Nate Heinel just got kind of hired on as like, you know, what the first professional tournament director, um, you know, as his job. Is that something that you see happening more and more? How, uh, what direction do we go to where we can legitimize being a tournament director and keep these like really passionate people, not from just doing thousands of hours of work for free? Yeah, um, this is something that I'm passionate about. And I've definitely shared my thoughts on different podcasts. It, uh, the inherent nature of PDGA tournaments without significant outside support or unless you have your own shop makes it very difficult for an event to be profitable. Um, that is changing literally under the landscape is changing under our feet as we speak. But because you have to provide 100% payout plus to pros, mm -hmm. um, there obviously is the delta with the payout with the amateurs. Um, and, you know, it's just golf was not so big in the previous years to actually warrant anything besides local grassroots sponsorship support, you know, mm -hmm. the local pizza shop or a local small craft brewery. So it's just challenging. Um, and never mind the TD. And then he's asking everyone to volunteer to do all the work. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it's really weird that there's no value on playing the event, right? Like yeah. I would, before discovering, uh, this game, I was an avid distance runner and I paid anywhere from 20 to, I don't know, maybe 150 bucks to run like the New York city of Boston marathon. Mm -hmm. And I got, you know, the course was shut down and I got, uh, you know, porta potties and I got goo and water 
And when I finished and I was a decent runner, like I didn't get paid. (laughs) Uh, There was no payouts for me. Obviously the elite runners, you know, they get paid, but my, my reward for my, my entry was the experience. Mm -hmm. And I find it very strange that in our sport, that's not taken into consideration. And that just goes back to like the sport in the late seventies, early eighties. And that it was whatever was put in comes out. And so Mm -hmm. all the responsibility uh, to run an event was on a TD. And if you don't have passion, then you're not going to do it. But thankfully we are, can I swear? Um, you can swear, bring it. Yeah. We are fucking crazy for our sport, <laughs> right? We yes. are, uh, rapidly addicted. Uh. And, um, you know, I've been a TD now. My first PDJ event was 2012 in the San Francisco Safari. So for almost 10 years, and it's taken me almost a decade to turn the corner where I now can look at the PL and say that we will be profitable for the S for the OTBO this year. Um, and you know, we have a team, including yourself of like eight to 10 guys that are essentially are working on a profit share model. And the first two years, I mean, I think we did a good job of taking care of you guys with swag and food, sure. and, but, uh, hopefully we can pay you guys this year and, that and would then be nice. scale and then scale. Right. Yeah. Uh, so it's like everyone on the team, you know, you and Jeff Faze and Sean Pearson and all those guys are have t- are taking a risk because it's time. Um, but I- I'm hoping at least this year, and then the sky's the limit going forward. You know, we have big plans to scale the OTBO. I want grandstands, thousands of people, media opportunities, large scale non endemic sponsors. Like, let's go. I love it, man. And I, and I you nailed it when you said that we are passionate i'll leave out the choice words but um <laughs> I, I really sean i appreciate your passion the san francisco disc golf community appreciates your passion um, i can't wait to see how everything goes with otb open um, i want to give you a chance though before we end this interview to talk to the people um is there anything you have to say to the community you know something you want to get off your chest yeah yes. <laughs> um uh, i'm so excited for uh the future of the sport it's something that I think we all hoped would happen. And I think the data now says it is happening. Uh, I said on podcast two, three years ago that looking at metrics, we were missing like zeros, um, factors of 10 on viewership, but you know, Joe Mez averaged a quarter million views last year. The pro yeah. tour did 20 million views last year. Our sub, our sub base on DGN is going to hit 20,000 this year. Like these are numbers you can take to marketers that are exciting. Um, we added a million new people playing disc golf in 2020, at least. Uh, you know, I don't, I can't wait to see you just study of count the sport um, because I think there's this this unknown quantity. So I just get on board now. Like it's time. We're finally here. You know, we were on ESPN. We're going to be on ESPN again this year, just so you know. Um, players are getting paid like decent money. Paige Pierce is off season in Hawaii, right? Paul, yeah. Paul Pierce owns, you know, acres with, you know, he's building courses on. Yeah, he like, bought a McLaren. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, and granted, those two are kind of on an island. Sure. Um, and also just to my friends and family out there that have supported me in this sport, I, I really appreciate it. Our sponsors, OTB, Innova, all the guys on, on what was Team SFO, which is now Team OTBO, mm-hmm. Sean Mercy. Um, uh, I know 2021 is going to be a, probably a hybrid year, but for 2022, we're looking to do big things. Like I want, I want a gallery. That's like, I have, I always had this, like, I have the, I like to establish these weird goals. that, uh, like I have a goal that drew Gibson yells at me because the crowd is too loud. Right. That's actually a goal that I have because if yeah. I get there, it means that we have thousands of spectators. Like, yeah, those are good problems. Yes. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Uh, well, I hope we have good problems too. Uh, but for now, let's just solve the ones in front of us. Uh, <laughs> Sean, I appreciate, again, I appreciate you coming on and spending your time. You've got so much to do. Um, folks, that is all I have for this interview. Uh, <laughs> make sure to subscribe for more coverage of all things disc golf.